I really wanted to kind of create an episode that felt like an accessible starting point for people who feel like they should care a bit more about climate change. Today's episode is with the one and the only Michaela Loach. I'm going to have to ask questions that are stupid questions. How can we actually change this climate crisis where people are insecure lives? And, and a way that we do that is... But three degrees of global warming would be catastrophic. Heat waves, dangerous wildfires. It's just going to get worse and worse. Our world needs climate action on all fronts. Drown, extreme precipitation, even fire. What's causing the climate crisis? Where the fuck would I start? I hate to be doomy, but certain corals and certain species can only survive at certain temperatures. Many island nations will still not survive. They will be submerged by rising sea levels. Would you be able to talk a little bit about how much we could replace with renewable energy sources? If you were talking to someone who said, I don't know nearly enough about the climate crisis, how would you get them involved? there are things that we can learn in order to be able to myth bust. I think what's so important about challenging these myths is because the UK government in particular are deliberately trying to push the <laughs> What is up guys and welcome back to Working Hard Hardly Working Podcast. Today's episode is with the one and the only Michaela Loach. She recently released a book called It's Not That Radical, where she's generally presenting the arguments for climate action and how you can kind of take climate action as, as is in the title, not that radical, pretty much common sense. Um, and given people loved the episode on the economy so much, I really wanted to kind of create an episode that felt like an accessible starting point for people who feel like they should care a bit more about climate change. Um, I think we all do. Personally, I personally think that we all probably have a bit of cognitive dissonance of thinking I should care about this more, but I'm not necessarily educated enough in it. And I feel like I'm asking questions that are stupid questions. And so throughout this episode, the aim is to give you a little bit of ammo when it comes to what is what, when people talk about the COP conferences, what are they, what do they, what does the Paris Agreement mean? Like what even is fossil fuel and can we actually go without it? Is it going to make everything more expensive going to renewable? And is that why we're not doing it? And blah, 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 blah. Um, so I hope you really enjoyed this episode. I really, really, really enjoyed recording it. And it goes without saying that Michaela has done some absolutely incredible work. We really owe a lot to the people who genuinely dedicate their lives to improving our environment and our politics and social justice issues when we are a lot of us, me included, are very happy kind of getting on with our daily lives and like caring about it, but not dedicating our lives to it. And I feel like that is an important dis distinction and it is important to platform these people, um, which is what I like doing. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I really enjoyed recording it. Visibility is absolutely key for me. I like being clear on what I'm spending my money on every single day. Revolut's budgeting and analytics gives you instant notifications and budget alerts whenever you spend. The app breaks it down for you really nicely, so you can see if you're overspending on too much homeware, for example. My biggest budgeting hack is that I segment my salary as soon as it comes in. It makes budgeting for the month so much easier. Sorry, I freestyle. Also, using Revolut Saving Vaults, you can earn up to 3% annual interest paid into your account daily. One of my nifty saving tricks is using Revolut's Spare Change Roundups, where they round up your card purchases to the nearest whole number so that they can save the rest in your vault. For example, if you spent £3.60 on a coffee, Revolut would round that up to £4 and put 40p in your chosen vault. Download Revolut for free and create an account now. <laughs> I'm really excited about it. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm very, very excited to have you here. Um, as I kind of mentioned, I think that, well, I, I think your work is absolutely amazing. And I know yeah. I've kind of messaged you on that before a while ago. Um, and I think, you know, I've loved, loved, loved watching your journey. And I think that now is a perfect time. Now you've had the release of your book and you've, um, it's done incredibly well and it's been so amazing to see. I really wanted to kind of get you on to be able to talk about some of the themes in the book and to also just kind of create a accessible space for people who feel like they should know more mm, about climate mm -hmm. change and the environment and all of the things that they're kind of like oh I almost feel embarrassed to ask about or I feel like if I said something at like a dinner I wouldn't be able to back myself up to that person who loves playing devil's advocate we all know <laughs> them um so yeah that's kind of like my idea for this episode and mm -hmm. I think that it will be I'm, I'm personally really excited about so it <laughs> <laughs> um but before we kind of get into the deep dive side of all of that it would be really great to kind of hear a little bit more from you about your background like mm. start from the very beginning how did you get to where you are now yeah I guess if we start from the beginning I was, I was born in Jamaica <laughs> in 1998 um 
And we only lived there for about um, two and a half years and then moved to the UK um, because it's safer mm. um, to want a better life like many mm. people do move. Um, and grew up in very white environments and experienced a lot of interpersonal racism because of that. And so mm-hmm. had this deep feeling that things are definitely not as good as everyone's saying they are. Right. Um, I think at school we're often taught in our history classes that like, liberation and change is something that was won for us in the past and that mm. now we live in this like golden age of freedom and right. we should just be like super happy and not do anything. Mm. Um, but I could just tell that wasn't right for so many different reasons. Um, and then I remember really clearly when I was a teenager, um, this photograph of a young boy named Alan Curdy on the on the pages mm-hmm. front pages of lots of newspapers. Um, and he was three years old when his body washed up on a beach in Greece, um, when his family were just trying to move for safety in a, in a, in a much more dire circumstances than my own. Um, and seeing that photograph, which was harrowing, and realizing that I was yeah two and a half years old when we moved over, and we were able to do that legally and right. safely and easily just because of the privilege of having a British father, mm. it really made me realize how much the world is just like this lottery, depending on where you're born, oh, 100%, and that yeah. the borders that are constru- con- constructed are also just like constructs in that way, mm. and that they cause harm. And so, therefore, I wanted to start changing that. So, I got involved mm. in. Um, as a teenager involved in like migrant justice organizing um, and went to Calais um, and like did some work on the border. But when I say that, I think people think it's very dramatic and I'm like, I was chopping wood <laughs> and like chopping vegetables and sorting clothes. Anyone can do it. It's right. very, we, we went on weekends, I went with my mum the first time I remember. Mm. Um, but that's what first showed me that to be an activist or to be, to care about an issue is just being active. It's just right. seeing something and thinking I'm gonna do something about it. And it doesn't have to be dramatic. You don't have to be shouting on the streets. You can just do something, whatever that is. Um, and the ordinary people in Calais really showed me that that change can come from us and doesn't have mm. to come from big institutions mm. um, because it was students that set up the organizations that I went um, and volunteered with. Um, and then at university, I started to care more about the climate crisis. Um, and at first that looked like changing behavior things like going mm. vegan and boycotting fast fashion mm. and, and those different kind of behavioral changes. Um, but I realized that that wasn't enough for how big this crisis was. Yeah. Um, and I still had this climate anxiety, this panic, um, especially at night, I wouldn't be able to sleep. Um, and so then I got involved with direct action campaigning. So mm. um, protesting on the streets and chaining myself to things and blocking some roads yeah. um, when it was a bit less controversial than it is now. Um, mm. And from there have then taken the government's court around fossil fuel subsidies um, and challenged a lot of different structures um, and communicated about this the whole way through, um, through social media and through writing. Um, and now I've kind of consolidated all of this into a book on climate justice um, because I think it's really important that we reframe this crisis. As, it's not just stopping the bad stuff. It's not right. just how do we stop the like climate chaos and collapse? It's the fact that we have an opportunity for a better world for all of us, a world mm. where all of us get to live in dignity, a world where these constructs that cause harm to people don't have to exist. Mm. Um, and I feel like we can't let that opportunity slide. And that's yeah. why I think it's so urgent that we talk about these issues. That was the most concise whistle stop tour I think we have <laughs> ever had, combining so many different things. That is incredible. <laughs> I feel like my like, um, biggest flaw is the fact that I cannot say anything in like a single concise way but that was incredibly I mean, neither can impressive. I normally I mean, that was my editor going through my first job of my book being like babes need to calm down on yeah. this yeah yeah um no I think that's really really interesting and I love the fact that there's been you know you clearly care about things very deeply as you should I don't say that mm. in a kind of like patronizing way mm. I say that in a point of view of like I think it's so we're so privileged in this country to be able to go through our, even our teenage years, if we wanted to not know about any of these things. Like, I think that firstly, you know, it's always true to say that to be apolitical is like a huge, huge, huge privilege and one that I don't think most people should um, indulge in. But even from like the, it just goes to show as well that kind of from the point that you'd come over here at at two Mm. um, and you kind of were all, already no matter kind of what you necessarily wanted to do Mm. in terms of your interests you were already kind of shown from the beginning there's so many things out there we need to care about and there's so many things that have affected me could have affected me even more that actually in this country like that's not the usual teenage path purely out of privilege like purely out of the point that we do have the luxury of just being like oh well I'm allowed to like not care about that yet. And I think one of the things that I love so much about the angle you've taken from the book as well is this kind of call to action in a way where it's not, you know, we were talking before about like whether you call yourself an activist and you do Mm. and lots of people kind of sit different places on that spectrum, but almost just being like, 
we need to be caring about these things. Like it's become very, very, very apparent. Like every single leading scientist, every single piece of information out there points to the fact that like we need to change the way the world currently operates. And for us to, we almost, it's going to stop becoming a privilege that we have to be, to not have a view on this. And I think that that's kind of becoming more and more apparent, especially like over the past year with lots of the things being overturned that we've been like, oh, you know, fracking, no, we did actually get rid of that for Mm. quite a big reason. Or even the fact that I'm just thinking about how every summer there's just more and more wildfires and more Mm. and more extreme heat and more and more flooding. And the climate crisis, which I think for a lot of people thought was this like future, a lot of people in the UK in particular thought this is a future issue that won't impact us for a very long time, Mm. are realizing that it is here and it is now. And it's also already impacting people. I think about how last summer and houses in London caught a light because of extreme heat. That's absolutely wild that that's happening now. But also we need to remember at the same time that that's been happening for communities across the world for a very, very long time. And that, a lot of the indigenous communities in particular who've been like in order to exist and live they have to resist um that that's not been a choice like yeah and as you said like a plus being a political is not a choice for for these people because in order just to like exist on their lands where they mm. should be able to be they have to resist these big fossil fuel companies or for communities who live in like more arid um climates in in central africa to exist to be able to like cultivate crops or or be able to eat um, has been made impossible almost because of the climate crisis already. And so I do think it's important that we realize this privilege that we have here, but at the same time, we realize that it's, I think that whilst it's important that we stop the bad stuff, it's also important that we realize that there's something actually exciting that we can move towards. And Mm. and that's kind of, that's why I wrote It's Not That Radical, because I think that so often we're told that with climate, oh, we're going to die, we're going to die. Like, and, 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 and you wonder why people switch off from that and get panicked and overwhelmed and just want to turn away from it. And I think instead if we say, oh, we actually have the opportunity to create a better world where all of us have more of the things we actually need. I think often it's also framed as that climate action is that we all need to have less. I think that it's a, we need to reframe that as less of what. And a mm. lot of the time it's less consumption of stuff that we don't actually want or need, but that our like current capitalist economy requires us to want to get more and more stuff we don't actually need in order to service its necessary growth and um, but actually that's not in kind of that doesn't work with the planet's boundaries and so instead we could have you know shorter working days we could have more like warmer homes in the winter and cooler homes in the summer we get uh, through insulation like very simple things that we um would actually make our lives better for the majority of people um, and we can have those through climate action i think it's really important that we frame it that way as well accessible like political education is so so important mm. and um that yeah that's the point of a lot of the work that I do it's like I am in a lot of different spaces where perhaps we've been doing this work for many years until we understand a lot of things um but if that information or that understanding or that awareness is not going outside of those spaces then we're not really going to be able to change as many things right and so the point of of writing it's not that radical as well was like how can I condense the last six years of organizing um and the things I've learned from that into 200 pages so and in an accessible way that I feel like I could give it to one of my friends that I went to school with that I haven't seen in many mm. years who isn't in these spaces that was actually a really big motivation it was one of my friends that I went um came and visited me and we were just having chats like very open chats about climate and I realized how I'd been in this kind of echo chamber of people mm. who understand these issues a lot and I hadn't thought about how could we accessibly reach people outside of that and mm. I actually had that friend in my mind the whole time as I was writing it yeah like would like, this be understandable yeah exactly yeah. And, I, and that's why I'd ask my editor I'd be like what do you think about do you think that um that this friend would would get it do you think that you'd be able to give it to your your mum or your grandma or your friend from uni that you haven't seen in a while and that was kind of um a big motivation in writing it I just think that that being honest is going to bring more people along because if we just think that people who I don't know, care about the climate crisis are all perfect, infallible people mm. who never do anything wrong and they like they never take an, an unclimate friendly approach to life mm. in any way, then it's not gonna bring other people on because we'll just look at them and think, oh, I can't be perfect, so mm. I, can't, I might as well do nothing. Like mm-hmm. when actually if we think, oh, I can relate to that part of their journey, I can relate to how they were feeling about that. Oh, I used to also feel that way or I currently feel that way. Um, but there is a path out that's way more encouraging. And I, I actually really, I, I drew on, um, Adrian Marie Brown's work around this quite a lot. She mm. wrote a book called We Will Not Cancel Us, which is so brilliant. Um, and I'd really recommend it to everyone. It's like a pamphlet, it's super, super short, but um, it talks a lot about how do we bring people in rather than making kind of movements that are, she describes it as movements. We don't want movements that are like prisons with high barbed wire fences. Um, instead, we want movements that are sanctuary for people who have caused harm and been harmed to allow be allowed space to grow. I do, th- I do think it's actually a really big shame that I think a lot of people feel scared to start talking about these issues because of this like, because people might react to that as, as giving more criticism. And I think that is a shame because I'm, yeah, we, 
as I said before, as Adrian Marie Brown said actually, that we don't want movements that are prisons with high barbed wire fences, mm. like where the bar to entry is so high that no one can enter in, or when, when you're in there, you're just getting harmed. Um, what we want is, yeah, movements to be a sanctuary. And, yeah. I, and I think that a lot of us are not doing that well because I also, I think we always have to ask when we're doing something, it is, it is like, who does this serve? Because I think accountability is important, like challenging people to be better is important. Mm. But who does it serve if anytime anyone says anything about the climate? Um, or about social issues that we make them afraid to say something about mm. it in the future. Like who's who's benefiting from that? And I think it's more so the ruling classes that benefit from that a lot mm. of the time. And I think it is important for us to like, yeah, call out when maybe something is, could be seen as greenwashing or inconsistent, mm. Mm. Um, but we need to create space for people to actually feel confident in talking about these issues. Yeah. Um, and we need to allow people to as well. I completely agree. People need to recognize that perfection does not exist. It's just mm. not an actual thing that exists. And it's just gonna hold us back in many ways. Um, but also something that I've done to work with people who have big platforms that don't mm. normally talk about climate perhaps, but are, I know they care, is I've been doing these kind of collab reel series where mm. I'll be like, I'll, I'll write a script. We can talk about the script afterwards and like talk about what's comfortable. And then we can record that together and we'll post it together. And so like there's kind of a, it's we're, we're in it together in mm. posting it but also that i think people feel confident they're saying the right the right thing, thing yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as, as such because um they have someone who's like an expert in that area working with them on it and i've done that i paired up also a lot of um my like co- i don't know if it's weird to say colleagues but other activists i don't know yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah in this space with people as well and we and we did these this big real kind of um output um around the ipcc reports so the Inter- intergovernmental panel on climate change they put out these big reports which is the most up-to-date science in the climate crisis um, and we found that those worked really well because people who maybe wouldn't have felt so competent to post about it themselves um felt more competent because they had someone doing it with them and that actually came from a briefing that we were given which was a briefing on the ipcc report for influencers which i think those things need to happen more of like how can we yeah realize that a lot of people aren't saying things because they're afraid of backlash but also they're afraid of saying the wrong thing so how can we make it easier for people yeah. in general, I think is something we yeah. should think about. So I want to get into that. Um, first of all, I really want to talk about the fact that you took the government to court while you were <laughs> at university. I feel like this is something that cannot be glossed over. Um, so can we start from the very beginning of kind of, you know, when I think of taking the government to court, mm. I think impossible mountain, yeah. very hard to climb. Um, and also where the fuck would I start? So I would like to get into that a little bit. How did this even come about? Mm. So when I talked a bit about my journey, so when I when it was 2018, 19 years, become a blur in my head at some point, um, I was part of a group called Extinction Rebellion in Scotland. Mm-hmm. Um, we were much more rad than the other XR groups, but that's not what I'm gonna say. Um, <laughs> but we had a site outside Westminster Abbey called Power and Truth. So at that time, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy was right next to Westminster Abbey. That's the same department that was both meant to be tackling the climate crisis. And it was also giving billions in subsidies to fossil, the fossil fuel industry. And so our site was there to raise awareness of this issue. So we kind of blocked the road for about a week um, and had a site there where we were doing political education. We talked to MPs as they walked to work. Um, and that was, and I put myself in a restful position in, in there to kind of raise awareness of this. Um, and then from that, I met a lot of people who also cared about this very mm. niche issue of fossil fuel subsidies that is not very sexy and therefore mm. doesn't get much um, screen time or airtime often because people are like, why should I care about fossil fuel mm. subsidies? What does that even mean? So basically, the fossil fuel industry are kind of propped up by billions in subsidies. It can amount to 11 billion a minute, um, which is wild, or even more than that actually. Um, in subsidies and these are what make it profitable for the fossil fuel industry globally to continue right. operating so subsidies are basically payments that the government give to these companies um to allow them to continue their, their activities and in the uk since signing the paris agreement in 2016 the uk government had actually given over four billion pounds in of public money in these subsidies or in tax breaks so basically oil and gas companies in the uk they were operating in the North Sea, so it was off the coast of Scotland, they were not having to pay tax on their operations in the North Sea, even though these are multi-billion pound companies. So companies like Shell and BP, these are huge, huge corporations. They weren't paying any tax and they were actually being paid money from the public fund. And um, so money that could be being used on hospitals or, yeah, you know. The big old yeah, NHS that yeah, we love. Exactly, or schools, you know, things that, yeah. that actually are for public good. Instead, they were being paid to these already multi-billion pound companies. Which already make profit. Yeah, and, and they did this to make the North Sea the most profitable place in the world to extract oil and gas. So to sure. make it even more profitable um, when it, they're already, these companies are profiting from very harmful activities. Um, and so 
I was obviously super angry about this, as were some other people. Um, and we'd done this kind of direct action route of, um, you know, protesting and, and not enough change we'd seen happen. So we were like, what's the next? So direct action is already a last resort tactic. Yeah. We're like, what's the next last resort tactic? Um, legal action. And so we came together um, and we met with Lee Day, which who are our lawyers, um, and we formed a legal argument, um, arguing that basically these subsidies were unlawful um, and they didn't make sense as well, given that the government had signed the Paris Agreement and had and agreed you, to climate action. Will you just give a brief, I know not mm. necessarily in depth, but a brief kind of like one liner on what the Paris Agreement is for anyone who yeah, doesn't Yeah, of course, know. sorry, I realise I've mentioned things. So the Paris Agreement was this really, really big climate agreement that was signed in like 2016, 2015. Um, and basically it was at one of the COPs. So COP just stands for Conference of Parties. It's mm. the once a year, every country in the world meets in one place. In 2015, 16, it was in Paris. Um, and they agree on a climate agreement. The reason why Paris is such a big deal and why we talk about the Paris Agreement so much is it was the time when the kind of 1.5 degree target was agreed. So this target of of how much warming we are going to be aiming for to be the minimum um, of warming. And in the Paris Agreement, the, um, countries signed onto this agreement, which was a really, really big deal at the time to say, we are going to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, and the reason why that 1.5 degrees was chosen is because above, sorry, hey, Ziggy. <laughs> Ziggy's on the run. <laughs> because um, 1.5 degrees is kind of the maximum with which a lot of countries in the global south in particular can survive. And so it was a really, really big win for those countries to get this agreement signed by all these countries. Um, but it's also important to point out that in the Paris Agreement, which is this big agreement that we often talk about as being, you know, the climate thing that we all want, um, fossil fuels aren't mentioned once. The words, sure. for, yeah, which because there are hundreds of lobbyists that go and make sure that doesn't happen, um, and that's where the social license thing I think comes in again. Um, but so basically, it's it's a really big deal. The Paris Agreement is really important, and the UK signed it. So therefore, they should. Be... Did every country sign it? Yeah, so in order for the, an agreement to come through, the, all the countries have to mm. agree, which is why things like fossil fuels don't end up being included because some countries will be like, well, we're not going to do that. And and worth saying as well that it, it, for exactly the reason that when you hear like a 1.5 in the UK, that means very little to us. We're like, yeah. oh, yeah, I can go to Brighton in the summer and go to yeah. the beach. But like for, as you say, people in the global south, that is, and many other places, but that it becomes unbearable. Things catch on fire. Things, you know, like everything yeah. changes. But, and... Yeah, 1.5 doesn't sound like that much. Mm -hmm. But what's important is, so actually the day when I decided to put myself in an arrestable position in the direct action was because we did a live reading of the one, of the 1.5 degrees report. Um, so basically each person would kind of rally, it's relay, so not rally, relay on reading a part of the report. And I read the bit about oceans and coral reefs and at 1.5 degrees or above actually at two degrees, um, we lose our coral reefs. Like it's that dramatic. And at 1.5 degrees, many island nations will still not survive. Like they will be submerged by rising sea levels. And it's, it sounds like such a small thing, but 1.5 degrees of warming, the impact that that has on Arctic sea ice, for example, or on global sea temperatures is actually huge because our nature is in a very delicate balance. Like it's meant to operate as it is. Certain, especially in the seas, certain corals and certain species can only survive at certain temperatures. And so 1.5 degrees is actually a huge change. We've already we've already made it to fairly close to, to that already. Um, and we're, I don't, I hate to be doomy, but we are on track for about three degrees of warming at the moment with current agreements. And so we really, really need to change um, very, very rapidly. And something that really needs to change is our fossil fuel kind of expansion and usage. And that's why tackling these subsidies was, was so important because if we can tackle these subsidies, we make the industry a bit less profitable, they're gonna be pursuing less oil and gas licenses and sorry, less oil and gas fields. And therefore we can keep more of it in the ground and prevent more warming, which is really, really important. And I think one of the um, misconceptions is that without, like we can't do a lot of things that we could do with fossil fuels with other more renewable energy mm -hmm. sources. Would you be able to like, do, because I think mm. for, a lot of people who are kind of like, yeah, but we need X, or they associate, yeah. for example, the cost of living crisis with the fact that we need, you know, usually the more environmental option is often more expensive, is mm. like the perception. So with someone who's thinking, okay, well, you know, I need to keep the lights on, mm -hmm. surely we need to keep this kind of, you know, these fossil fuels going. Would you be able to talk a little bit about how much we could, we could genuinely replace with more renewable energy sources? For sure. The, so the most recent IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this like all these hundreds, thousands of scientists come together. They said that the cost of tackling the climate crisis is far, far less than the cost of not taking action. And also when it comes to renewables, renewables are actually, I think more than it's, 
it, I wasn't sure if the five or three, so we'll go three, because um, that's the conservative one, but um, at least three times um, cheaper than fossil fuels to produce energy from, to produce electricity from. So it's actually much, much cheaper to use renewables than it is to use fossil fuels. But for, the reason why we have all these doubts, I think comes from the fact that the fossil fuel industry have invested more money probably than they've invested in renewables into these kind of PR the PR campaigns these to make us believe that like to doubt the science to make us doubt these things to make us believe oh we do need actually more oil and gas but in the UK in particular if we if we look at the UK and the North Sea um the UK government released this kind of energy security strategy after when the war in Ukraine began and oil prices spiked and the cost of living crisis really really began so they were like we're gonna we're gonna tackle energy security we're gonna bring out this report in this report, there was nothing on insulation, which is something that would actually help people in both the short and long term, and it would actually reduce people's bills because they'd be spending less money on energy. Um, instead, they were like, we're going to just make more oil and gas in the UK. And that would lead people to think, okay, more oil and gas in the UK will lower my bills. Mm. But in actual fact, any oil and gas extracted is sold on the global market to the highest bidder. The UK has no control over setting those prices at all. The market sets the prices. And also, the UK has no control over holding that oil and gas in the UK. So there is, there's no way that we'll either see the oil and gas in the UK so for example currently 80% of oil and gas is exported um, so it doesn't actually end up staying here but also we can't control those prices what we can have control over the prices of is renewable energy like and, and community controlled renewable energy which is happening in places like Bristol um, so we can have more autonomy we can um, mm. remove ourselves from the volatility of the markets um, renewable energy won't be impacted by a dictator deciding to take war against another country um, and it can be cheaper as well so I think it's actually important that we tackle these and bust these myths yeah. um, because we have to realize that these myths have been out there. And I'm not saying that people, I don't want people to feel bad about believing these things because there's been a very deliberate campaign to make you believe these things, that, that there is doubt or that there isn't certainty or that it's too expensive or too difficult. When actually, we actually have all the solutions that we mm. need. We just need to prioritize them. For our case, the government actually denied that they were giving these tax breaks and these subsidies. Oh. But on, yeah. But in, <laughs> <laughs> well, then we all know yeah. it's wrong. <laughs> yeah, but then in court, they can't deny it. They can't lie. Mm. Um, and so they have to say, oh yeah, actually this is true. But they'll try and spin it obviously, but and mm -hmm. they actually tried to spin it as they were like, these aren't subsidies because we create a different definition. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, they were like, even though the, the International Monetary Fund and every other body defines this as a subsidy, in our definition it's not, which is just it's really funny. It's quite funny. I'm like, you tried. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so putting things on legal record is really important on public record. Um, making an injury visible, so making an issue visible, one that possibly has not been known about as much before, so that kind of happened through our campaigning, and to put it on the political agenda so that it's something that people are really actively thinking about. Um, and so it means that even if, and then it was another one is to win and then change the law. Sure. But even if you don't win and change the law, you still have achieved a lot if you are thinking yeah. about it as like it, as a campaign. That's so interesting and such a kind of, I mean, so interesting from a kind of PR point of view as well about the fact that like a lot of what we consume in the media isn't necessarily, you know, I'm sure lots of people who knew about that campaign and that legal action won't have known what the outcome was and I think mm -hmm. goes to show obviously how well you guys handled it and how you managed to kind of point that in the right direction I feel like it's so interesting in a social media world as well that like what actually happens is not the point it's mm. the how do we draw attention to things and actually all of those things you were talking about point to that social license like how do we remove the social license for the yeah. fact that this has been under the carpet how do mm. we draw attention which I think a lot of you know actually from the, if you're not in a kind of legal space or don't have a lot of contact with, I guess, like legal professionals. Which I did not before no, this case, exactly. yeah. No, <laughs> exactly. Like you're not gonna necessarily know that actually the majority of things that you hear about in the press never even go through, never mm. come to fruition, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. The actual, you know, talking about it and putting it out there is 80% of the battle. It's, it's, it's storytelling is, is really, really, really important. And, and I think it's, it's how we tell these stories. Cause so we, we, we went to court Mm. and our, our case was given permission to court so it was seen as, as, a, as a as a valid case because mm. that the suit the court does not often do that so we went to the rural courts of justice i wore a ridiculous pink suit then worried if the judge would go against our court because our case because she didn't like pink i was <laughs> sitting, in the, sitting in the back of the didn't realize that you have to bow as you leave a court so i got up to go to the loo and then everyone was like bow 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 and i was like okay i'm <laughs> bowing and walking out it was a bit of a strange day um yeah sat through a day of 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 it was quite difficult actually that day to be honest because hearing the government's lawyers um, make arguments that I don't think are very moral, and in the, it just in the sense that they're doing their job, mm. but the 
saying like, oh, the government is so proud to be supporting companies like Shell and BP. And when I work with impacted communities who have been impacted by these companies, I work with communities um, in solidarity with or have or have friends who have been really, they've had their water poisoned by these companies. They have mm. had um, family members murdered um, in relation to activities around these companies. And it was quite hard to sit there and have and hear them defend that support. Um, in the end, um, we got a result from that. So on that day, you don't get a, a result on the day. Um, I remember just feeling quite overwhelmed. I think I was quite burnt out at that point. Mm. Um, and then a, a month later, or a few weeks later, um, I, we got an email from our lawyers being like, I can't tell anyone, but we've got a, we've got a result. And I had this feeling that we'd like lost on the legal grounds. I just, mm. like, I've just felt it. Um, and we had, we had lost on the legal, mm. like, it wasn't seen as unlawful. So under UK law, it was not unlawful for them to be paying this money. So this was happening, but they just deemed it, the judge deemed it on that day not to be unlawful. Um, and in that moment, I did feel like we'd failed. Um, but then I got perspective very soon after, yeah. thankfully, um, to realize that we'd, we'd done a huge amount of, of work and that it was a mammoth um, task to change the law in that instance on this very specific law, on this very specific issue. I remember seeing um, a comedian called Hassan, I can't remember his full name, do, do like a, a skit where um, he went into a fast fashion store and changed all the labels um, to have the true cost of it on mm. it, of like who the, the how much that person was paid, the like, the situations they're being put into and the harm that's caused and when and then people went in they obviously didn't buy anything because mm. they were like oh I, I wouldn't if I knew that that was the cost of it I wouldn't do that so the most sustainable and cheapest clothes that um any of us have are the clothes we already own and kind of repairing those making them last for longer making sure we take care of them really well and then shopping for our friends wardrobes instead is a much more sustainable and much more much cheaper option than going out and even buying new fast fashion which ends up actually not being that cheap anyway because it mm. breaks and then you have to buy more of it yeah but if you have a piece of clo clothing that you really look after for a very very long time that you really care about um that perhaps you save up for and you invest in then that's going to be yeah much more sustainable and much cheaper and you also like it more because then then you don't buy as much just random shit like i think so much so many of us i mean i remember i used to I would just get something because I think it looked kind of nice. Yeah. I don't know, because I'd be like, oh, that looks okay. Like, whereas now, if I get something, I have to feel absolutely amazing in it. I have to yeah. be like, I will want to wear this all the time. I'm going to have to wear this a hundred times. So I'm going to love it that much that I'll still be wearing it however many years from now. And I think that's made me love my wardrobe so much it's more. It's so true when you confront some of those habits when you're kind of like, again, I thought the exact same. And I thought that to be an influencer, I had to be wearing X amount more and whatever that it might be. Of, especially on, on influencers and people on social media, I think it puts this pressure on to be living like an aspirable life in some mm. way and therefore to have to do certain things in order for people to look at your life and think, oh, I want a life like yeah. that. Because for me, I watched The True Cost and it, I could not buy fast fashion mm. after watching it because I just hadn't been as aware. I was, I was, I think I was a teenager at the time, but I, was, I remember just be thinking... I wish I wish I'd known this, yeah. but you know what? I didn't know before, and that's and I didn't know, and that's all right. Yeah, yeah. You know? but, but once you do know, I think it's when you're being willfully ignorant. When yeah, yeah. when any time a video or something comes up on social media that is talking about it, and you keep scrolling, maybe notice that and yeah. wonder why. Maybe it's because there's some discomfort there, and so, challenge that discomfort. So that's actually what made me change to vegetarian in the first place. I remember where it was kind of like I was seeing everyone talking about all of the documentaries, and then I was like. I can't watch the documentary because I'll feel bad. And then I was like, okay, so that's willful ignorance. And then mm. I moved to cognitive dissonance. So then mm, you move to the mm -hmm. fact that you know something, but you decide to stay kind of not taking action against it. Like, you know, you don't like it. And I'm like, of course, everything takes time. Yeah. And of course, things are going to take kind of, you know, going to take like steps and trying things and learning and mm. realizing like what you're capable of and all of that. I think one of me, like one of the most important things was actually kind of, at least moving from that willfully ignorant place mm. to knowing that, you know, I still very, like there are always going to be things that I, you know, partake in that are more harmful, like all of these mm. things, but actually not allowing myself to be in willful ignorance. Yeah. In terms of things like making sure you're following pages like yours, like mm. pages that generally kind of raise awareness and will educate you for free <laughs> on kind of what's going on in mm -hmm. order so that you're at least moving to cognitive dissonance. Like that's better than willful mm. ignorance. Then when you're at that point, I did start to realize that I was just like, 
as long as that's on my feed, I'm mm -hmm. probably going to check myself like a little bit more regularly. And yeah. that was just a way that like, not even publicly didn't say anything about that, but it's like so starting to surround myself with things mm. that would make me feel worse about certain things that I knew I shouldn't be engaging in, but it still was. And I, and I think I think it's also, cause I get asked sometimes like, oh, do you wish you just didn't care? Which I find such a weird question because I think us not knowing these things or us not caring about them wouldn't mean they aren't happening. Sure. Um, like me not caring about climate justice doesn't mean the climate crisis goes away. Or like me not knowing about the harms that fossil fuel companies like inflict doesn't mean that they just stop happening. Mm. Um, and I, I think that the only way that these things are gonna actually change is not by us not knowing about them or us being ignorant to them. It's by us like forcing ourselves to look at them yeah. and then moving forward and, and changing these things. And I think that that like feels like a much more like, I don't know, it feels like such a better, for me, I felt better since doing that because I think when I'm deliberately ignoring something or I'm deliberately looking away from something, you know in your head that you're doing that, you know you're doing that and it does make you feel a bit shit. Mm. <laughs> and, I, and I think I've felt a lot less shit <laughs> since yeah. I've started being like, I'm gonna face, I'm gonna face the darkness and I'm mm. gonna challenge it and, and, and pour light into that space instead because that's the only way that these things are gonna change. And as you mentioned before as well, that's not necessarily about then knowing about those things and then confronting them perfectly. There's still mm. going to be holes in the way you're dealing with things. Sure. There are gonna be certain things that are gonna be easier. There are gonna be yeah. certain things that you're like, do you know what? I'm just not ready to move away from like my one fast fashion order at the beginning of summer every mm. year or like whatever it's going to be different for everyone i'm not kind of yeah. co-signing anything not kind of but it's going to be different for everyone and as soon as you also allow yourself both to not be cognitively dissonant but also to be able to approach it with a kind of i can be imperfect about it as long as i know what i'm imperfect about mm -hmm. and therefore can maybe open myself up to changing it in future yeah. or at least be aware of it. Like that willful ignorance, I think is the most harmful stage, mm -hmm. especially when there's so much information out there now. Yeah, and I, and I think I think also a lot of us are very anxious about these things as in generally, like whether it's social, social issues, what's going on in the world or it's the climate crisis. I think a lot of people, especially like recent studies have shown how much climate anxiety as a thing, for example, is impacting people. And my dear friend Tori um, Choi wrote a book about this called It's Not Just You, which I'd really recommend cheeky plug for my friend um but climate anxiety is something that's impacting a lot of us and i think that people think in order to feel less climate anxious anxious just don't think about it don't sure. look at it stay away from it but for me that didn't help for me the only thing that's actually helped is i think of emotions like energy like it can't, energy can't be created or destroyed but only transformed and the same way i think our emotions they they are not really like created or destroyed they are transformed within us and if we are ignoring the anxiety that we're feeling, if we're just looking away, it's just gonna fester within us and we're mm -hmm. gonna feel worse about it and we're gonna feel more anxious and we're gonna like, yeah, it's gonna manifest in lots of different ways. But if we transform that feeling of anxiety into action, if we transform that by changing something, by doing something, by coming together with other people who feel similarly, um, then it's not gonna fester, it's gonna be transformed and also it's gonna actually change the thing that we feel anxious about and that's the best thing that we should we should actually do in, in how we respond to these things. Yeah, and I think that's a perfect place to end. I think that was, um, <laughs> I mean, I really, really, really enjoyed this conversation. I feel like it's been very, very, very important. And I hope that it will open people up to feeling like, and myself as well, like I, I don't say like open people up from a point of like expertise and from mm. a point of like, you know, perfection or like any of this at all, like not even in the slightest. I just mean in terms of, I feel like the more we know, the better, yeah. the more we feel like we can act no matter what it looks like, the better. Mm -hmm. I always need like a reinvigoration. Like I do allow myself to get kind of, you know, willfully ignorant appointment and I allow, you know, mm. we need to kind of have this kind of reinvigoration, re like pushing towards where we kind of want to move and what we think is right. Um, and I feel like this will be very helpful for a lot of people in terms of kind of opening that up and working out what type of action might be right for them and mm. why they should care. And a lot of things around what, you know, when we hear it in the news about the cops and about the different, mm. you know, the Paris Agreement and all of these things, it feels like a lot to learn. It feels yeah. like a specialty that, sh you know, is is tough to kind of get into. And I think the work you're doing is incredible on Thank showing you. that, well, it's not that radical to use that, the, the title. It, yeah, I mean, because if I can like, like add one thing at the end, um, because I think that yeah, often in order to take action that does transform our world or that doesn't tackle the climate crisis or that does like, yeah, make a best world for all of us or that does tackle these systemic issues of, of white supremacy and capitalism, all these big things, it is framed as being ridiculous or like 
impractical or not possible or extreme or radical in some ways. And I think that what's so important for us to do is to reframe this as this is common sense and this is what we all actually want and this is what we actually can do and it's very possible, it's very possible within our lifetime to do. Um, and so that's why I wrote It's Not That Radical. Um, and I... <laughs> And I just, I really, 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 really would love people to to take the time and read it because I do think it's a, like an accessible way that people can learn about these issues in a way that will move you towards action. It won't require you to leave behind every single thing that you care about or love in your life, but instead it will just move you in a way which I hopefully will transform the world around us. Um, and I, I've condensed it into a short space, so um, so hopefully it'll be helpful. And and thank you so much for this conversation and for all of your support generally over over the years. It's been um, well received and I'm really grateful for it. Not at all. You've done the work and I'm just <laughs> happy to be there like, woo! Um, but thank you so much for coming on. You've been amazing. Thank you.